And today our speakers are going to be Marisol and, Mar and Mary. Um, they're going to be talking about cover crop characteristics and identification. And Mary is our livestock environmental management specialist. Um, and she's based at the Carrington Research Extension Center. And Marisol is our forage research specialist on campus here in Fargo. Okay, so today is gonna be a little wild and just a little bit different. Uh, so we are going to um, do a lot of polls, but then also a lot of talking with those polls. So the polls are gonna be based around um, identification of cover crops. And so um, we had uh, one of our lab techs at the Carrington Research Extension Center grew, has been growing cover crops for me throughout the winter. And so um, if we'd have done this live, we had several sets of cover crops grown and we would set them out uh, with the seeds and the seedlings and you guys would identify them and then we would come back together and talk about it. So because the cover crops were already growing, we didn't want to waste or lose that opportunity. And so I brought all of these cover crops home um, into our, our tiny house and I took pictures of them. And then um, we, Marisol and I created a presentation to hopefully give you some idea of what they look like in case you've never seen some. So we have a few oddballs in there. We also have some that look the same um, that you may think, you know, I know exactly what that is, but it might be something else. Uh, and so we have 21 of them. There's not polls for all of them. Um, and the way we're gonna do these is they're just like the other polls that we've done at the end where we say, uh, rate your usefulness, but instead it's gonna be, what is this and what family does it belong to? And you're gonna get, I'm only gonna give you just a few seconds on each one because we're gonna do so many, I think you're gonna be ready and you're gonna be watching your screen and you're gonna be active the whole time. And then uh, we will, I will stop with the polls for a second and Marisol will actually talk about the plants and some of the characteristics to go along with them. So I'm going to start out with um, just a, a slide here. I'm going to let Marisol uh, talk, and she's just going to chat a little bit about identification of um, grass parts, so grass plants. OK, thanks, Mary. Um, before I go with this, I just want to uh, thank our sponsor, the, uh, the CER, North Central CER, that provided the funding for this professional development program. and so. Yeah, this is kind of interesting because we use this usually live, you know, this is like a lab, how we identify, but Mary did a great job at taking all the pictures and, and so we'll, we'll see how this works. And we, in cover crops, one of the things that's important is that you know how to recognize the plants. So this is a little bit of a class and we, I use a lot of these lights on my forage class. And so the first, so what we're going to do is just give you a little uh, brief, uh, description of what you have to look in this cover, in this cover crops identifying. And, and I'm sure if you study agronomy or then of this, you probably seen some of this stuff, okay? So, because I uh, will show you pictures with our names and, uh, and Mary's gonna do the polls and ask you what it is. I know pictures not the best like, because, you know, you can see 3D, but I think she, she was very good at trying to take those key structures. So um, one of the important families in cover crops is grasses, right? And we have several grasses and to identify grasses in seedling stage, that means we're not a panicle or a seed head, we need to look at what we call the color area, okay? Um, I don't know if, uh, since you're sharing the screen, can you show it uh, the color area? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So um, the color area is where the, the blade, you know, the leaves of the grasses are, comp uh, they have two main things, right? The blade and something called the sheath, okay? Which is the bottom part. Those are connected in the color area. That's what we call the color area and that's what is drawn here. Now, different grasses have different characteristics and we look for structures in the color, color area which could be the first one are the ligules. You can have a very large membranous ligule. You can have a hairy ligule or simply the ligules not there. Okay, so by looking at the color area and looking for this characteristic, you'll be able to tell which kind of grass it is in seedling stage. 
And the second uh, structure that we look on the color area is the auricles. Auricles are, are like appendages that are more, they're kind of hugging the, the leaf where it connects with the sheath. Okay, and, and some crops are, have very long claw-like ones they cross and somebody said like big, you know, like uh, barley has that. And then we have some uh, short stubby and there's some uh, plants, they don't have them. There's no articles in there, like oats. Okay, so when May shows you the pictures, I'm giving you some of the, <laughs> of the information where you have to look for, okay. And then there are other characteristics of the colors, but we're not gonna use those much. We're gonna use basically, and the picture she took are, are focusing in the legals and the oracles and the color area. Some other ones have like hairs, like rye has a very hairy sheath, okay? And, and while uh, barley and oats, they don't have hairs or pubescence, okay? So here is a, some of the, uh, another close up of what we have in here. Um, and you can see, uh, these are the things we look for and the leaf teeth will look for hairy or for hairs, right? Uh, if if the, the sheath of is open, you see there's like a V, you can have a V shape in there, okay? Articles, like I said before, absent, short, uh, medium or long and hugging like claw-like and legios can be there or not and can be short blunt can be toothed that's like sorghum or sudan grass they have like a jagged or toothed legio and the leaf blade um, in this picture shows the twist but I always say uh, don't use that for plants grown in the greenhouse soil lab because the conditions of the where the lights come in is going to change that so you can use that um, direction of what the leaves rolls in, in the field if you want. But in greenhouse plants, we don't use that because it doesn't follow it. You'll, you'll find plants, they're going, leaves going in both directions, okay? Um, so this is the basic information of description of grasses and the structures that we need to identify them in seedling stage. Okay, and I know some of you, you know, they, this is used also for identification of weed grasses, okay, in seedling stage. Uh, but it's a lot more complex, you're going to have a lot of things, but it's the same idea that you're looking at the color area. All right? Okay, Mary. <laughs> okay, so we are going to do our first plant ID. So let me, uh, let me go ahead here and find our poles. And I'm going to launch it and there we go. So you should be seeing the pole right now. So you can see in the, in the center picture is very clear that she's showing the color area of that plant. So you and have so to look just a hint, if the polling box is in your way and you're thinking, I can't see that, you can just drag it over, just click on the top of it and just move it over so then you can see what Marisol is talking about. So you can see a very large ligule there, membranous ligule, okay? There's no uh, really articles. You can see very uh, much of an article in there, so. So about half the folks have voted and um, this one is not very hot potato because I want to give you guys a chance to figure out what the heck we're doing here um, but the rest of them after this one I'm going to do pretty quick uh, so we can roll through them so I'm going to go ahead and end this poll don't feel bad if you guessed and you're thinking you're wrong these are all anonymous we don't know who's guessing what we just want to have give you the opportunity to to try your hand at some of these and see what you can do so, okay, end the poll. And I wanna share the results. Okay, so this is a sorghum hybrid, uh, the BMR, so this is a grass. And so most of us got it. We were a little confused, Marisol, maybe forage barley. Yeah, but you, you forage barley, we have really long ones. And this one, you see the jagged legal? I mentioned before that sorghum has a jagged legal, like teeth in there, okay? So that's, and, and Mary, a good job at getting a good picture of the, 
<laughs> of that. Okay, so I'm sure most of you are, are gonna get this. <laughs> All right, so let's do pull two. Okay, so here is our second poll. You guys we can go seats. ahead and start. We have seeds too, so that's gonna help you too. If you, if you have hard time with the plant, in this case, we're showing you the seeds too. <laughs> I have to say, I didn't even think about that when I, when I wrote the potential answers. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsie. It's gonna be very obvious it's not one of those, <laughs> all right? right. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna end and share. Yeah, okay, so, <laughs> so this one really well. <laughs> <laughs> this one indeed is foxtail millet. All right, so after we go through a few of these, um, I'm going to stop sharing so that gets out of your way. Um, now we have a, a slide that Marisol is actually going to talk about. So those were warm season grasses, the two that we just went through. So Marisol, do you want to talk just a little bit about those? Yeah, okay. So uh, warm season grasses, and these are the two we have. There's more than that, right? But yeah, we put these two because these are very common cover crops that we use, uh, especially for uh, full season uh, cover crops for grazing, for preventive planted situations. You, here you see the list of many other ones. We only have two of them, right? There's forest sorghum and the fox millet in the pictures, but we have all these other ones. These are crops that require warm temperatures to grow. And these work great uh, like in the summer you know, because that's when they grow, that's when you get those good temperatures. Um, and they're very high in forest yield. So whether you plant them alone or you plant them in mixture, these are gonna provide a lot of, a lot of forage, okay? A lot of biomass yield. So if you are thinking, you know, your interest is have a full season uh, mix for grazing uh, for the summer, where it's planted sometime in June or if it's a preventive plant maybe in July, you want to have something like forest sorghum in it because you need the volume, right? That you need a lot of the forage. Um, and in general, these grasses are low in protein, but if you if you graze them when they're still green, most of them do uh, have the they, they do cover the requirement of protein that beef, uh, you know, that a beef cow, like Miranda talked in the last webinar, a 1,200 pound beef cow with uh, with a calf is needs about 8.5 for same protein and most of these grasses will have that much, okay? They're excellent annual summer forages. The only, the, there's some limitations. One of them, you don't wanna plant them in, after August. Like these are not good cover crops to plant after wheat harvest. And it's because they need so much temperature, temperature they're really not gonna grow. So you're not gonna get forage for them. And so uh, it's, it's not, really the best choice for that. You have other crops that are best choice for fall and fall grazing or winter grazing. Now, we always get questions, I'm sure we're gonna get more, uh, the prusic acid toxicity, and we have a webinar that talk about that. Uh, that's something you, you have to uh, watch, but it's not as serious as people, uh, you know, uh, people always very scared because it's cyanide, right? But forest sorghum and Sudan grass and sorghum Sudan have that, but only when the forest is damaged by hail, by light frost. Um, and if you have a mixture, chances are you are not going to have much of a problem. Okay. If you're really worried about that, then the millets don't have that problem, but they're a lot less yielding than the sorghums and Sudan grasses. And well, you can ask questions about all of them. Don't have time. Hi, 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 hi. Hey, uh, oh. <laughs> Ty, are you pee? Okay. All right. So um, that's general, and I think we're gonna leave the questions for the end, right, Mary? Uh, yep. And you guys can always go ahead and type them in. Miranda's watching the chat pod today. And so Miranda, you can always just interrupt too if you think there's something that would be easier to answer right away. We can always do that. If, you know, if there's one or two on each of these groups. Um, so up to you, you just let us know. Sounds good. Okay, so, all right, next up we have, 
this one so you can take a peek at it while I'm getting the poll ready here. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So I didn't do it on this one, Marisol. No. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end that and share the results. So this one, ooh, we've got almost a tie. Marisol, <laughs> what do you think it is? I don't remember what it is, Marisol. <laughs> Well, I'm glad she put it together. And in a way, um, you both can be right. The, it's, it's different. It's very difficult to identify triticale from cereal rye uh, because, as you know, cereal rye or rye is a hybrid between wheat and, and rye. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, triticale is a, is a hybrid between rye and wheat. So it has the characteristic of both. The difference so is usually that the cereal rye has a very dense uh, uh, set of hairs in the um, in the sheath. Okay, so down here. Which I don't, yeah. And I don't know if I see them, but this one also has aracles with hairs, which is the characteristic of wheat, right? So here, uh, in Triticale has a characteristic of little hairs on the oracles, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but I don't see, Mary, I don't remember what you put in there, but I don't see really, <laughs> really uh, the very, uh, but maybe they're not visible. So this one is forage winter triticale. That's what I thought it was because, because of the seed, not <laughs> because of the plant. But it's good that you show it because these two will be hard, very hard to identify seedling. The yeah. only reason I was thinking that it's triticale is because of those articles with hairs. And I don't see the really fine hairs on the sheep that it would be on rye. Rye will have very fine hairs on the sheath and this plant doesn't show it. Another thing that rye has that is a little different than triticale is that it has kind of like a purple coloration on the sheath and I don't see that either. Now if you look at the seeds you would know that that's triticale because rye looks different than that. The seeds are different than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you guys don't feel bad if you got rye uh, because they both look very similar. <laughs> so you will say so, that you both have it right. <laughs> so based on that lesson, what do we have here? We pretty much just told you, right? <laughs> Tried to not make them too tricky, but a little tricky. Okay, we are going to end. It's been about 30 seconds, and that's so far. Okay, okay. so um, definitely a grass. And Marisol, you gave us the, the distinguishing yeah. factors, so go ahead and I'll point to them. Yeah, you see that uh, this is where I was looking for the other one, and I didn't remember what order she put it, but I couldn't see the hairs. <laughs> and, and you see it has like a purple coloration on the sheet. Mm -hmm. You can see very clearly the hairs. But you don't see a larger oracle with hairs like in the triticale. So these these are the, the ways to, but I, uh, you know, when I do this in class with the students, these are two that are very difficult to identify unless you have a very good sample that really shows the hairs. And in pictures, this was hard, but Mary did a good job. And you see how fuzzy the sheath is, okay? And that purple coloration also is very typical of rye. And Marisol, does that last when the plants are bigger? Um, so this is this one here was more of a seedling. So they were planted about three, let's see here, three weeks apart. Um, so some of them I have seedling pictures and some I have both. So does that purple coloration last then into when the plants are bigger? I've seen it, it usually last no, no when it starts heading it get bigger I don't I don't think I've seen it so much but in seedling mm -hmm. stage it's very typical yeah um, and I think it depends too in what soil you grow it and I don't think all varieties are the same I've seen varieties they don't have so much that purple coloration 
That's why sometimes color is not the best ID, but you can add it to the ID of uh, hairs. So this one, because of the hairs and the purple coloration, it's very clear that it's uh, cereal rye or winter rye. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, and this is the last one in this series. So uh, launch, okay. So this is the last one in this grab <clears throat> series. You guys gotta get this 100%. <laughs> very large oracles. These are huggers. Mm-hmm. Look at the seed too. <laughs> the seed <laughs> the seed is, is pretty obvious. You've seen the, the crop before. Ooh, we're 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 divided, huh? <laughs> we're we are like right on half and half divided here. You're gonna have to help us out. Okay, so I'm gonna end that. Oh, I'm gonna share so everybody can see. Okay. All right, so you see I see there and the very large hugging articles we call it is the big barley. Okay, so this was barley. Okay, uh, oats does not have oracles. Okay, no oracles on oats. So that's that's a big difference, and this is something that is easily uh, identified in seedlings in the field or in the plant. Okay. Well, I like that it, big barley. Big barley. Okay. Big barley. <laughs> big hugging barley. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, there's another one. I lied. Whoopsie. <laughs> I even made this thing. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> what is this one then? Okay, you gotta get this one, guys. <laughs> if the other one was barley, <laughs> what is this one? <laughs> it is not a radish. I think they know that. They're very good on families. That's good. And so that last one was forage barley. Um, and Marisol, that's important to have in a cover crop. If we wanna graze it, we would wanna forage barley. Well, um, forage barley varieties, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it, but forage barley varieties, the difference is, is they don't have ons on the spikes. Okay. So the animals don't get pinched <laughs> when okay. they graze it. Now you have it in a mixture and you can have regular barley and, and you're probably gonna graze it before even heads. So I don't know if that's much of a problem. Now forage barley varieties are really good quality, but they're also more expensive. And so it'll depend of what the farmer wants to do, okay? If you are planting forage barley for hay or forage, only forage barley with just a legume and you're gonna have a lot of that, then, then you want more forage barley because the animal's not gonna like the, the ounce of the regular barley. Mm -hmm. Okay, good so <laughs> I distracted us a bit, but this is our last grass. So good job, we got the grass. Uh, and it is oats. It is oats. You see, it does not have oracles. And it has a very large membranous ligo. ligo. Okay. So I will stop share. All right, now I'm going to let Marisol take over uh, for a minute. And Marisol, you were going to talk to us about cool season grasses. All right. Okay, so cool season grasses, um, cool season grasses are a very important component on cover crops, especially when we're talking about grazing, right? Because this, they grow in cool conditions, so we can have them growing very early in the spring and in the fall. So they're great for grazing. They're great in mixtures. So you can put them in a mixture with some warm seasons and you'll have, like if you plant a mixture in May, uh, the cool seasons are gonna go faster. And then the, later in the summer, the warm seasons are gonna take over. So you kind of uh, stagger them, which one's growing first. And then in the cool season grasses, we have winter rye, which is a cereal, cereal rye. And it's a very winter hardy. It's pretty much the, the only very winter hardy uh, uh, cover crop that we have. I know it depends on the area. Like a, a lot of you are gonna say, well, the forage winter triticale is winter hardy too. It probably is in the western part of, the, of North Dakota and probably maybe in Montana, but it's not in the east part of, uh, 
in, of uh, North Dakota. I plant winter triticale here in the Red River Valley. I've never have it survived, never, never survives here. But if you are like in center, um, in the center of uh, North Dakota, it'll, it'll survive most winters. So winter rye is, is very important in cover crops because um, since it survives the winter, it, it provides a green cover in the spring when we have the most erosion and also removes moisture. So when winter rye before soybean, especially in these wet springs, is, is ideal because then the, the farmer will be able to plant, if he's gonna plant soybean on another uh, crop, uh, uh, it's gonna be able to plant early. Now, winter rye even is, is great. There's certain things you have to watch for, you know, like I have it below, um, immobilization of nitrogen. Uh, it doesn't work very well with corn yield. You don't wanna put it before a, another cereal like wheat or triticale or uh, because you're gonna have uh, contamination. Okay, you're gonna have contamination. You won't be able to kill all the plants and some of the rye goes to seed. You're gonna have a, uh, you know, a problem with that. Allelopathy, some toxins, root diseases move because grass to grass move diseases. So rye is a great cover crop, but you have, there, there are things that you have to look for. Like if you're gonna plant corn or wheat, if you have wheat, you don't want it. So here's where the other cool seasons are important. Um, if you are going to have a wheat crop next year, or if you are going to have probably corn, you are better to have a, a cool season cereal that winter kills, like oats or barley. Winter barley doesn't survive here either, so we don't have winter varieties. So oat and barley will winter kill here. Uh, it won't be growing, it won't be green in the spring, but it still will provide the cover with the biomass and you won't have the problems with uh, the rye can cause and corn and, and wheat too. Wheat doesn't do good at all when you have rye before. Uh, you usually get hit and yield plus the problem with contamination. So these are key uh, cover crops, especially for grazing you want to have in the mixture, a cool season grass. Even if it's a summer mixture, you wanna have one. If it's a fall planted crop, like if after your wheat, you can plant one of these grasses, especially if you're gonna have soybean next year, you might wanna have rye. Now, some people don't wanna plant the grass because the volunteers of the wheat are gonna be good enough. And that depends of what, you know, uh, what your objective of the cover crop is. So autumn barley here, you know, they're winter kill, but it's still really good cover crops. They're excellent forage quality. So any uh, mix that, you're gonna have a cover crops for grazing, I, it, it'll be great to have these crops. They're very good quality. They grow fast. Um, the, the seed is not very expensive. Um, and another characteristic of all these cool season grasses and really all the grasses is they have a symbiotic association with fungi in the soil, with mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and that's why in, in pictures that I've shown in other presentations, you'll see that the soil is attached to the roots. It gets stuck. It's because these fungi produce these glue-like um, uh, compounds that uh, allow that and improves the soil aggregation and that improves water infiltration. So having these cereals on the mixtures of cover crops is key for a good soil health, okay? You can use autumn barley for hay, for silage, for grazing, or a mixture with some legumes if you need to bump up the protein. Very digestible fiber. Uh, the highest nutritive value is, is at, uh, um, it's at a soft dough stage. And that's because when you, the grain it starts forming, uh, then you have starch in the grain and then increases the value, okay? Um, and you can use them planting in the early spring, you can plant them in the fall, you can use it for, uh, for fall grazing, even winter grazing in some areas. Marisol, we did have one question. Um, okay. Does the aleopathy from rye affect broadleaf crops? That's a very good question. Um, actually, uh, for crops, we haven't seen much of a problem. At least rye does not affect soybean. Now, we do know that some broadleaves are sensitive because cereal rye, we use it as suppressed weeds, right? And we've seen the winter rye uh, suppress kochia. So, and kochia is a broadleaf. So, it does have an allelopathic effect for certain broadleaves. Now, I, I haven't heard that any 
problem with at least the the broadleaf crops that we grow, like uh, beans, dry beans, uh, sunflower, uh, sugar beet. None of those, at least, there's no reported uh, allelopathy, the toxicity. But um, I guess there, are, there could be some crops, the broad leaves, they could be sensitive since we see some weeds being sensitive. But I don't really know. Maybe uh, Mike Osley, that he, I don't know, he's on the call on the uh, webinar today, but uh, he talked a lot about uh, herbicides and residues and they've done more with allelopathy. I don't know, Abby, you have another uh, comment about that? I don't know if Abby's in, in there. I think she is, but. Mm -hmm. Nope, Abby said not that she doesn't. Um, we did have, I'm gonna just ask one more question and then maybe we'll hold to that until the end for more so we can move on. Um, I see, uh, let, let me answer that one on winter rye since we're in that. There's a question on winter rye. You said, what is better, winter rye or cereal rye? Um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because there is a confusion, right? Cereal rye and winter rye are the same thing, okay? The reason we call it cereal rye is so people do not, do not confuse it with annual rye grass, okay? Which is a completely different species and this completely different cover crop. But winter rye or cereal rye are the same thing. We really do not grow spring rye varieties in this area. There's no really availability. So we don't have spring cereal rye, okay? Um, so, um, some people want to put annual rye grass in the mixtures. Um, we, we really don't like, you know, it, it is a very good forage, but the problem with annual rye grass, it can become, it can become a weed and it could survive the winter. Uh, so we rather stick with cereal rye, which in, in our case and in all these, the, in, at least in North Dakota, Minnesota, it is winter rye. Okay, it's a winter hardy rye. I'm glad you asked, you asked that. Okay. So, uh, Marisol, you were gonna give just a quick brassica versus legume, uh, just in case there's people that get a little confused before we go into the identification of such things. Yeah, well, we're, we're gonna have brassicas and legumes, you know, in the pictures now. Of course, they don't look, that's it. This should be a little bit easier for you. Now, on the brassicas, where we look at the cut leadons, these are these are seedlings, so you're gonna look um, the, these are all, most are family, they're all full seasons, uh, they're single leaves, but they have uh, different uh, cotyledons, like the radish have heart shape, and the rape or rape seed is, is uh, kidney shape. And then you'll see also you can look at uh, the jagged borders, like ra radish has really uh, jagged uh, borders, while uh, mustard, camelina, turnips, they have more, more smoother while the radish is really jagged, okay? And the, and the legumes, then the identification is through uh, the leaves. You know, legumes, we have cool seasons and warm seasons. Uh, most of them have what we call it compound leaves or the correct word is trifoliolates, but you've heard trifoliate is the same thing. I'm just a nerd, so use trifoliolate. And, uh, and that means, trifoliolate means that one leaf has three leaflets Okay, in multifoliolates, it has more than three leaflets. So clovers, are, clovers and alfalfa, sweet clover, those are typical trifoliolates. And um, pea, fava bean, hair vetch, lentil, chickpeas, those are multifoliolates. I mean, there's a lot of little leaflets in one leaf, okay? Uh, and many of them have what we call the tendrils, you know, those little structures that they kind of uh, attach, like in peas or hair vetch. Those Tendril is really a modified leaf. Leaf is still a leaf. Another thing of legumes that's great, and that's why we really want them in, in, in cover crops uh, mixtures, is because they fix atmospheric nitrogen. And so they put nitrogen in our soil. So they, they're really good and they're very high in protein. Okay. Okay. All right, let's do some more identifications. So everybody uh, get ready with your clickers. I will turn this on. Okay, what is this? Um, 
right. I'm going to push us along just a little bit, so don't feel bad if you didn't get to vote. We're just going to have to be real fast on the clicker. So uh, this is a turnip, and it's a brassica. Yep. And so um, uh, the next two pictures that I show, they don't have a poll to go with them. So, oh, I'm not even sharing the results with you guys. Goodness, there we go. Okay, so the next two pictures I show are not going to have a poll with them, Marisol. So do you just want to quickly tell people, I can tell what they are, if you want to just maybe explain a little bit about them. Uh, we didn't have enough polling space for all of them. So we are going to go through these next two kind of quickly. Okay. Turnip, so I can say something about the turnip too. Oh, okay. Back to turnip. Oh, bugger. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, um, just a little thing about them. So this is turnip. You know, the brassicas are very interesting crops for grazing, cover crops for grazing. This is These are crops that you don't want to use for hay uh, because they contain a lot of water, you know. They're, they're very, they have a lot of water. They're super digestible. These, these crops are great for grazing. Uh, turnip is one of them. Now, turnip, you have to watch it if, uh, as, if you're going to use it just as a cover crop for soil health. Uh, turnips, they can have the problem that the bulb, these ones don't have the bulb, right? But the root can get uh, really big in areas where there's low density. And then you can have problems for planting next year because it doesn't degrade in the, in the winter. So you don't have, um, you're not going to graze this mixture. It's only for soil health and uh, soil erosion protection, uh, we don't recommend that you put this type of, of brassica, okay? Because of those, they could cause problems and get caught on the disc of your plant in the following season. Now for grazing is great. Now all brassicas, is this not only for turnip, all brassicas, since they're very highly digestible, you need to provide some type of fiber, okay? Whether it's all hay or, you know, or straw, if it's only brassica, but the best thing is just put them in mixture. Put them in mixture so you have the fiber in there. You know, you have sorghum, you have millet, then the cows will be able to have a balanced fiber versus these. If you just have cows grazing just in brassicas, you want to make sure you don't stand behind the cow because you probably can imagine what's going to happen. Okay, and so um, very nutritious, high in protein, very digestible, but they need a support of a fiber crop, right? High fiber for supporting the function of the rumen. Okay, you can move it. <laughs> That's general okay. about them. Um, here is, uh, this is uh, rape, rapeseed is, is, is uh, the same no. as canola. Hmm? No, this is the leaf turnip okay. hybrid. Oh, you have the hybrid one. Yeah. I yep, brassica. <laughs> and then this yeah. one. That's right, right? Is a brassica hybrid. Oh, okay. So I didn't do polls on these two because they were, they're a little confusing. Yeah, um, this, this brassica hybrids, you, you have a turnip hybrid, what we call leaf turnips, and they're a mixture of a rapeseed, and that's why I say a rapeseed, right? Rapeseed with a turnip. So uh, they do have characteristic of both, and that's why Mary didn't put them. And so these are, will be, those that will be very hard to identify. So I, I cannot tell them apart because since they're hybrids, they have characteristics of both. And they look a lot like a rapeseed. So um, the hybrids, like a, a leaf turnip hybrid is important because it doesn't have the root bulb. So um, you can plant it, you, you won't have that concern. It produces a lot of biomass and a very high quality. The same with the, the other, um, this, the, there's other hybrids like Winfrey, which is a different types of species. You know, the turnip, leaf turnip uh, is, is a mixture of turnip. Uh, one is a turnip with a mustard and the other one is a, a cabbage, it's an oleracea with a rape, right? So they're different species, they're hybridized, okay? So um, I like some of these hybrids because they really, they, these hybrids uh, were uh, bred and produced for forage purposes in New Zealand, most of them, um, some in the States. And then they produce a lot of biomass, especially late in the fall. They're very tolerant to frost. So for fall, late fall grazing and winter grazing, these crops are fantastic. You can have your mix in the summer and what's going to happen? 
they won't have much production during the summer because they don't like heat. But as soon as you graze or cut the rest of your mix with uh, millets and, and uh, oats or sorghum, these crops are going to start growing and then they will provide a lot of forage for the fall. Okay. I'm going to, um, I'm going to make us go a little faster so we don't run out of time. Um, so let's do this one. What is the ID on this one? So we have a poll here. If folks want to answer. <clears throat> okay. So I'm probably not I'm probably not going to let you talk about these, Marisol. Um, we're going to finish the brassicas, and then I'll let you talk some more, if okay. that's okay. Sounds that good. way we can get to folks' questions, too. Uh, so, yes, this is a radish, and it is still in the brassica family. So, good. We got that one. Okay, next up, you guys can take a look at the picture here. And here's your poll. What is this one? I'm going to give you a hint. Marisol was talking about it already. Okay. Still not quite certain what we have. So the last one was a radish, and I do not have two radishes. Okay, so this one then is the rape that Marisol was talking about. Marisol, do you just want to talk about that one really quick? Yeah, uh, well, rape or, uh, is the same as canola. Okay, yeah, there's some forage varieties and some winter ones, but uh, winter rape types don't really survive here either. Okay, so the most common use is the dwarf Essex um, type, and uh, it, it's good in mixtures, but uh, if you're really interested in high quality brassicas for forage, this is not the best one. So when we test them all together, leaf turnips and the other hybrids like Winfred, they have much better uh, nutritive value and they produce a lot more than this one. Now this one, and I know Avi really likes it, um, these are great for soil health because of the root structure. Okay, and that's most of brassicas and we, you're gonna let me talk more about them later. So <laughs> I'll tell you about the, the root structure. <laughs> Okay, what is this one? You guys are good. <laughs> there was a lot of certainty right away. Yep. Yeah. It sure doesn't look like sorghum, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 30 seconds, gonna cut you off. Okay. All right. And this one then is white mustard and it is still a brassica. So there's a few people thinking we're sneaking some legumes in on you, but not quite. Okay. And then our last one of this series. Is this one. I think some of these are kind of fun because we don't often maybe talk about um, probably any of these three uh, that I have for choices. So I thought this was a fun question. Fun or frustrating could also be. All right, so this is winter camelina and it is also a brassica um, since Marisol did talk a little bit about brassicas already. I'm going to let her finish. I think she had some stuff about uh, soil and root structure. Yeah, um, yeah. I was talking about digestibility and all the brassicas will be the same. Now, 
I, I want before I talk about the roots, muster is more for like soil health. Cows don't really like muster. It's too, it, it doesn't taste that good. Okay. So I wouldn't put a whole muster for grazing, but in a mixture is good. And the roots, the roots of all these crops, uh, they have a deep tap root that they can pull a lot of nutrients. So it, it helps with uh, with uh, scavenging nutrients that otherwise would be lost to leaching, like nitrate. Okay, you don't want uh, nitrate to go into the water. And so these crops are great for moving nutrients uh, to the top of the soil. Okay, the nutrient scavengers, they also reduce soil compaction, increase inf infiltration. So all the brassicas have that characteristic. Now there are some like the radish is specifically used for that because of the larger taproot. Um, and then winter camelina is, a, is like a new cover crop. And the, the importance of winter camelina, I, I will say camelina is very good for forage, not because it's, a, it's toxic or anything, it's because it really doesn't produce much biomass. Because since it's a winter carving, and you can see in the picture that Mary showed, is the rosette, it produces a rosette. And so it's very flat. So it really, and even if you plant it in the fall, and even if survives for the, survives the winter, it will survive the winter and the spring, it doesn't produce much. But it does move a lot of nutrients, the scavenger. It's also an oil seed that you can harvest for oil. Um, and really, in this area, winter camelina is pretty much the only winter hardy broadleaf that we have. So it could, it could have a really interesting place on cover crops before corn or before wheat. Since we said that we don't want to put rye in those conditions, winter camelina will be a crop that will move uh, nutrients, uh, water, especially in the spring, because it will survive. Now, camelina doesn't like heat at all, so you don't want to plant it earlier than September 1st because it, it, it might not survive the winter if you plant it too early. Okay, it's very sensitive to heat. And so it's an, we don't know about everything yet. You know, we've been studying camelina as an option before corn and wheat. We don't have all the results, but we think it will be interested. But as a forage quality, we've done forage quality and it doesn't seem much different than the other brassicas, but it produces a little biomass. That is your objective is to produce biomass and I wouldn't put camelina. Okay, awesome. So, we have our next poll here. <clears throat> this one will be tricky. You're tricky. Okay, I'm gonna share these results. So it is indeed a legume, so we got that. Um, and this one is forage pea. So this one is a forage pea. Now I'm gonna show you the next picture. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and show you this next one. This next one does not have a pole with it. So we had a forage pea, and now this one is um, a winter pea. So here's the winter pea and the, oh, whoops, wrong way, and the forage pea. So these are two legumes that we use in our mixes. All right, what is this one? Okay, we are pretty certain on this one. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So this one is a uh, fava bean and it is also a legume. So you guys nailed that one, no questions asked. I did not confuse you with the winter pea, lack of question. So good job. Let me get this next one going here. Okay. This is another one in our Legume, <clears throat> legume series. I don't think I can trick you guys with the family stuff. We really didn't want to put that question on there to trick you. We just really wanted to put the family question on um, to help you associate 
what belongs where. Remember that trifoliolate tree leaflets are typical of what? <laughs> what, what legumes have? You know that's a legume, so. Okay. I don't think they can be tricked on the legumes. No. So this is crimson clover and it is also a legume. Okay. And our next one here, if I click the right spot, we will get it launched. Okay, there we go. So this should be 18. What is this? Oh, they are paying attention today. <laughs> no one is being tricked. Okay. Wow. We're, we're just going to share the results. So this is definitely cow pee and it is a legume. So nicely done there. And then I think this is the last one in oh, one more. the legume yeah. series. Yeah. Oh my, I picked the wrong question. Bugger. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> huh. What did I do? <laughs> oh, there we go. Awesome. Thank you, Miranda. Okay, what is this? They all know. <laughs> <laughs> they do all know. All right, we will end polling and share that. So this is sun hemp and it is a legume. Okay, now Marisol, I'm gonna let you take over for a minute. Yeah. All right, um, you guys did a great job in, in identifying them. See, legumes are, look very different from each other. Um, legumes are really important and what I did here more than the, uh, I have the functions in the next slide, but here I wanna separate the legumes with our cool seasons and warm seasons. Uh, just just like we did for the grasses, the warm season, uh, like cowpea, sandhem, soybean, mung bean, any warm season legume you wanna uh, uh, plant it on a grazing mix or for cover crop for preventive planting in the summer. Okay, don't want to plant any of these ones uh, after uh, like a wheat harvest or after August, the first week of August, because they won't grow and they get, they'll get uh, frozen and they won't grow much and won't produce anything. Another very important thing with all these warm and cool season legumes is if you use any cover crop of these ones, you should have an inoculant. That means inoculate them uh, with the, the correct rhizobia that you can buy. And this, especially for those that we don't grow usually, like cowpea, like uh, sun hemp, if you don't put a rhizobia, they, they're not gonna really fix nitrogen and that's what you want it for. Mm -hmm. And we have a fava bean, an interesting one, and we have the crimson clover. There's many other clovers, but crimson clover is one of the most common uh, clovers used as a cover crop. So very important and mixtures for grazing because they provide a protein, they fix nitrogen, right, with synthetic association. Uh, they're also the scavengers. So a lot of people don't, uh, don't realize that, that, uh, that uh, uh, they fix, uh, I think my video stopped by somebody. We're having some issues with your audio, so turn off your video to see if that would help. Oh, okay. Yeah, my audio says my speaker not working. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So um, I'm almost done, so um, I'll try closer. Um, so they're very good scavengers. That means they move nutrients from the, uh, the soil, just like radishes and brassicas do. And uh, they, they do, uh, they're really good for soil health. And uh, even they fix nitrogen, if there is nitrogen in the soil, like if you fertilize them, they'll, they'll use the fertilizer first. 
okay? Because fixing nitrogen takes a lot of energy. Very good for gra uh, grazing. Uh, the flowers are great for pollinators. Um, so you want to have them in a mix. Now, one important thing, usually when you're grazing or even you're cutting, after the first cut, most legumes do not regrow. So um, they're gonna come, most of them, off on the first grazing. Okay. And you sounded really good there at the end, Marisol. Okay. <laughs> so we have two left. Uh, and these two are a little special, so we're gonna do two. And then uh, Marisol will end, and then we will um, go for questions. So let me launch this one. All right, so what is this? <laughs> And no matter what family it is, I think I'm going to have to have Marisol pronounce the name. <laughs> All right, I'm going to end that and share the results. So indeed, it is buckwheat. And Marisol, how do you say its family name? It's Polygonaceae. Okay. Polygonaceae. <laughs> Polygonaceae or Boraginaceae, but that's not the one. Yeah, Polygonaceae is the correct one. Uh, most of you have it. So, okay. um, yeah, buckwheat uh, is, is important in mixes. You don't want just to have buckwheat for a grazing mixture. All right, and this is our last ID question. I think this one's kind of fun to look at. It just looks so whimsical. <laughs> All right, I will end the polling. You guys are pretty sure it is the Celia. And how do you say Borginacea? Borginacea. Borginacea. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so I'm going to click to the next slide. Now you can take over uh, before we have questions. Yeah, I, I'm going to go fast because since there's going to be questions and I think we're running out of time. Um, okay, buckwheat and fascilia, uh, I, they're not as common, but they're very good in mixtures. And these two plants have two things in common. Both of them um, uh, are warm seasons. Both of them uh, increase the availability of phosphorus in the soil. They have an association with mycorrhiza. They release phosphorus in the soil. They're nutrient scavengers, right? Uh, and they both attract pollinators. The bees love these two plants. So if you want to increase, um, you know, food for the bees, if there's, if you have bees, or uh, these two are fantastic for that. Even Facilis a worm season, um, actually it's very tolerant to frost in the fall. I've seen these plants still survive in the end of October and the few bees that are left, they're all in there because they really like the flowers of these plants. But none of these should be planted just for forage. Um, you want these, these are components of a mixture. Okay. All right, with that, I think Miranda said there might be a question or two. So I'm gonna have Miranda take over for a second here. Yeah, so we do have one question that was unanswered from the grasses section is why won't winter triticale and wheat grow on the eastern side of, of the state? Okay, um, well, the conditions that we have in the winter on the eastern part, especially in the Red River Valley, are very different. So it's, uh, they do grow and some, some winters will survive, but they have a lot higher risk of dying than if you plant them in the west. And it's a combination of um, very heavy clay soils, a combination of lack of snow, but the main thing is we get um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the winter hardiness uh, is very related to moisture, okay? When you have excess moisture in the fall, and especially these heavy clay soils, the plants, the winter plants cannot, um, cannot adapt to the cold. They cannot acclimate and, and get the, with the hardiness, you know, uh, working. So, if you have a very waterlogged 
false season, like last one, chances are they're not going to survive, okay? Uh, and so the conditions of soil temperatures, you know, we can, in some years we don't get snow cover and then we get temperatures uh, below zero Fahrenheit very quickly in November, December, this damage the plants. But it's a winter hardiness is a combination of water in the soil, ice cheating and all kinds of things, not just temperature. And unfortunately in the Eastern part, we get a lot of those combinations that pl kill plants a lot more often than in the Western part. We normally get killed uh, winter wheat and, and uh, uh, winter chiricale, but alfalfa many years, size two. We get winter kill of alfalfa in this area. Okay. There is a poll open, so please um, answer that when you, when you have a chance there. And I'm gonna close this one soon. A um, Couple more questions coming in. Mary, I don't know if you wanna ask those. Yep. I'm just need the little bugger to come back here for a second. There we go. Now I can find it. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So there's a comment uh, that is very similar between eastern and western Kansas. Western Kansas has a lot of winter wheat, uh, so not much on the east side, a lot more clay on the eastern side. Uh, which group of crops would not recommend to plant late again? I'm from southern Manitoba and are planning two cover crops per season. So which ones, Marisol, would you not recommend to plant late? Okay, you don't want to plant late any warm season, okay? No, no warm seasons for planting after the first week of August or so. That means no sorghum, millets, cowpea, sun hemp, any warm season, whether it's a legume or a grass, it's not gonna have much of a chance to grow and it's gonna get frozen when it's still very, very uh, small. And so it doesn't do any help with the soil health or produce any forage for grazing. Mm. I just launched a poll. I see several of you are answering it. If you have any additional comments about today's webinar, please throw those in the chat box for us. If you had any technical difficulty today, as in other days, you can always put that in the chat pod too. We definitely go through and read those. Uh, our tech guy, Scott, is always on with us. And so he goes through and, and tries to read those and make sure that he can help us for the next time. If you need CEUs for CCA, you can uh, self-report and you can do that at certifiedcropadvisor.org. Our next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, April 21st. So next Tuesday at 11 a.m. And it looks like Miranda launched our last poll here. So just an affiliation. So um, our evaluator can figure out um, how many we had government versus a uh, farmer and farmers with livestock. So we kind of know um, who we're targeting here and what kind of follow-up we can do for that audience. Uh, the recordings have been being put up at this uh, link here at our livestock extension grazing management cover crops page. And so um, they're there. And then at the end, Miranda, um, so after Tuesdays then, so probably not till Wednesday or Thursday once all the videos are processed and everything is, is up for sure, um, Miranda is going to send an email out with the links so that you have the links to those and then any of our resources. Uh, so that would be um, a place to look for that. And since you registered, she has your email address. And so that's why we asked for that. Um, just looking to see if there are any other questions. If you guys do think of any questions, um, I know we raced through this. We weren't sure how it was going to go, so we really appreciate you sticking with us today and and uh, participating in all of our polls. That was kind of fun for Marisol and I. I learned a ton. I'm the manure person, uh, and so I learned a ton uh, getting to go through and do plant stuff, um, and it was fun because Marisol and I got to meet a few times and and really learn from each other, um, and she was able to teach me some of these characteristics um, that she taught you today. And so we appreciate you sticking with us. If you do have any follow-up questions, you can email Miranda or myself and we'll for sure get those to Marisol and, uh, let you know. And it's looking like. This was really great. Thanks. Thanks for attending. I, I think it was fun. I agree with you, Mary. It was fun. Yeah. So with that, Miranda, I think we are good. <laughs> Thanks everybody and like Mary said the recording will be up and it usually 
takes about 24 hours for us to get it, or Scott, to get it edited and up there for us. I know several of you that were on today were on yesterday during our FSA programs webinar on conservation programs. We have another one in that, set, that series scheduled for next Wednesday at 11 as well, and that one's going to focus on farm programs. 